Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge, after being wronged. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, the company gave me a lot of money after the nonsense boss. The second story, econ department thinks they can go over budget. The third story, boss closed the restaurant after not paying the workers. On to the first story, thanks for the all expenses paid maternity leave. About three months after I graduated from college, I finally managed to land my first real job in my field, working in marketing for a medical office. The pay wasn't great, but it was a job in my field and I would have been silly to say no. I worked right under the CEO of the company, we'll call her Mary, and for the first nine months everything was wonderful. Mary was so impressed with my work, all my coworkers loved me and were glad I joined the team etc. I had a few unfortunate circumstances arise over the course of a three month span, the death of my grandma, my friend fell while visiting from abroad and broke his jaw, and I got my wallet stolen in NYC. These were all crazy unfortunate events that I had to miss a few days for, but they were not good enough excuses for Mary. She had a history of going after people one at a time for the pettiest of reasons, and I was to be her next target. Luckily her husband, who also worked at the company, loved me and was able to keep her off my heels for a while. A month after my last absence Mary hired Jerry, whose job was unknown to everyone in the company. Most of the 30-person staff was unsure why he was always creeping around our office and he showed a great interest in me. He would assign me menial tasks to complete and make sure to look in my cubicle at least once an hour to make sure I was working. It got a little annoying because I didn't even know who he was and I wasn't supposed to be working for him. After a few weeks of this strange behavior, it was announced that Jerry was to be the new chief business officer of the company and he would be my new boss. I was a little nervous about this, but mostly I was relieved to not have to report to Mary anymore. Jerry and I developed a great working relationship, much to Mary's dismay, and he thought I was great at my job. It had turned out that Mary had assigned him to monitor my performance, hoping to find me slacking off or any other reason to fire me. He came up empty-handed and had then convinced her that he should now be in charge of me because the CEO shouldn't have to be tasked with low-level employees' day-to-day -day management and monitoring. He did this because he was fond of me and knew I was good at my job. He was trying to save me from her strange vendetta against me. Well, about three months after Jerry officially became my boss, I found out I was pregnant. I had terrible morning sickness and my work performance started to decline slightly. I was throwing up in the bathroom at least five times daily, but because Mary had instilled the fear of God in me, the last time I had called out, I never missed work. Mary was still tracking my every move and she noticed my minor slip in performance. She used this to her advantage and called a meeting while Jerry and I were working in another office for the entire staff. She spent the entire meeting talking about how marketing was failing and slandering me to the entire office. I was very close with many co-workers and they had texted me right after the meeting and told me all the BS she was spewing about me. Although most of the office was on my side, she convinced a few of my co-workers to start accusing me of not doing my job and I was berated with email after email of demands and accusations. This was too much for newly pregnant, not emotionally stable me and I broke down crying to Jerry. At this point I knew I had to tell him I was expecting. He was so happy for me. He told me not to worry about Mary or my mean co-workers, that he would take care of them. He said, the most important job from now until the end of your life is taking care of your child. Two weeks went by of me vomiting every day in the work bathroom, still scared of Mary's potential vengeance, when I gathered all my courage and announced to my co-workers one by one that I was expecting. They were all very excited for me. I told Mary's husband last and asked him if he'd tell her for me. I mentioned that I was nervous about Mary finding out, but he reassured me that she was a mother too and that she would understand. I went home for the evening with a smile on my face, hopeful that Mary's crusade against me would finally be over. Later that night I got a text from Jerry telling me to come into the main office in the morning instead of the other location because Mary had a new project for us to start on. Naively I didn't think anything of it and went to work in the morning thinking all was well with the world. I went to my desk, set up my laptop and was getting frustrated that my email password wasn't working when Jerry poked his head in my cube and told me that Mary was ready to see us. She asked how I was and I said fine, except for the morning sickness. She ignored the comment about my pregnancy and began to tell me how I was no longer the person that she hired. She said that my quality of work had steeply declined over the months and that she never knew if I was going to show up to work or not. I now knew where this was heading. She told me she was letting me go so that she could find someone capable of doing my job. I broke down. I was 24 years old, 10 weeks pregnant and unemployed. I ran to my desk crying hysterically and Jerry chased after me. He took me into his office and assured me that he was already doing everything in his power to try and find me a new position within his sphere of influence. 
He told me over and over that he and Mary's husband had both told her not to fire me, that it was completely unfair and unjustified, and there could very well be ramifications, but she didn't listen. He escorted me out to my car, and I somehow managed to drive the 10 minutes to my boyfriend's house while in complete hysterics. By noon that day, over half of my coworkers either texted or called me, telling me how sorry they were, how unwarranted this was, and how they would do everything in their power to help me find a new job. Some of them even broke down crying, in the middle of the meeting Mary held to announce my firing. My boyfriend told me I needed to find a lawyer ASAP, but I was so distraught I didn't get out of bed for what seemed like a week. About a month after I was dismissed from my job, I found a lawyer who was chewing at the bit to take my case. I signed the papers with him and filed a discrimination case against my former employer. Mary was quick to respond to the original notice, with four pages of slander about how terrible I was and how she didn't even know I was pregnant, all a load of bull. After about a month of back and forth, she finally understood that she didn't have a leg to stand on and that she needed to get a lawyer. A month after our lawyer's first correspondence, the company agreed to settle with me, as to avoid court and what would have been a certain loss. Most of my friends have left the company, but last I heard she was still power tripping and making Jerry and everyone else miserable. She continued to slander my name for a good six months after I left and blame everything that went wrong on me, even though I was no longer an employee. I had my daughter in November, got to take a lovely maternity leave on their dime, and am now happily employed working in my field for a different company with amazing growth potential. The second story is, cut my budget, I'll get that back and much more. Before I start, I want you to take everything I tell you with a grain of salt. Every bit of information I have is at least secondhand, and normally do not dabble in university politics or budgeting. I am merely a student that worked part-time for the library department, I'm about to tell you about. The whole thing unfolded over the last two years, and just culminated in what I would deem the most professional way of handling the interest of the many, in spite of the greediness of the few. So, I'm just a mere student at a university somewhere in Europe. The university has departments for a lot of different fields of science, but the two main players are economics and law. Both of them get anything they want, even if it happens by taking from others. When I was in my second year at this university, I started working in one of the libraries the university provided. There are four different libraries. Law, Economics, Philosophy and Languages, and Math, Science, Political Science and History, and was delighted to have an extremely committed boss. Now, about that boss. He was the born librarian, loving everything from upkeep of a library to doing research and providing all different kinds of services for students. Before I came into his team, he had implemented long hours in all the libraries. We were open from 8 in the morning till 12 at night, revamped the online search and added a three-dimensional floor plan to make finding books easier, did reviews including the students, learning the libraries four times a year, developed courses for students on how to do better research, which were made mandatory in a few areas of study, and did a whole lot of other things. He was truly amazing. But as you can imagine, all of this cost a lot of money and was only possible because he had found a lot of sponsors, the biggest of which was some kind of investor who graduated from this university. Him getting all this money on board and his commitment to the cause will make his reaction to the economics department building a totally unnecessary underground section of new rooms, which also meant basically rebuilding a whole wing of the main building and going vastly over budget, much more understandable. Half a year after I started, the dean announced that there was a deficit in the budget of about 3 or 4 million euros. That in turn meant that the other departments had to take a step back and that the money from sponsors would go towards the project started by the economics department. About a month later, the library only opened until 8 p.m., and the courses on research were disbanded. Not only that, but the dean told my boss that he would have to fire at least a few of his full-time workers and give more hours and work to the students like me that normally would sort books in their free time. Needless to say, he was royally peeved. He put about 10 years' worth of work into gathering money and building up his department, and he wouldn't give that up without a fight. He started by going over his own books, which proved that his whole department before the cut was functioning well under budget, and that cutting his ability to do his work was completely unjustified. He then looked over how much of the money he got from sponsors and actually went to his department's budget, since when giving money to the university, the investors weren't really able to demand where it was allocated. He found out that only about half of this money actually went into his budget, which of course wasn't a problem up to that point, because he had more than enough. When the next budget revision came along, a year after the budget cuts, he put forward that information and proposed an audit of the use and necessity of the building that was finished just then. You see, the economics department had argued that there weren't enough rooms to accommodate the rising number of their students. So over the next half year, the usage of the new space as well as all old spaces was monitored. This audit was finished last year in August. Meanwhile, my boss started to groom the sponsors he had pulled on board. He asked them what they thought about how the university was managed, how happy they were with their money going to other departments, and if they wanted to change anything. And they were not amused. A lot of these sponsors, including the very big one, wanted something changed. They didn't have any influence on the university politics directly. 
but the one who owns the money owns everything. So they went to the university and told them that they were unhappy, at which point the dean and everyone else in charge realized that if they don't change something, the money flow would dry out, only increasing the already way too big deficit. Then the results of the audit hit. After monitoring for half a year, the university found out that the amount of dedicated rooms before building the new project was more than enough and that the project specifically was not only over budget, but the same number of rooms would have been able to be generated by renovating an older building for much less. The new rooms were also only open to students in the economics department, and thus didn't really help the university as a whole. In the end, my boss got all his workers back. The libraries were again open till 12. His courses were reinstated and expanded, and a larger chunk of the budget was allocated towards the library department. The economics department, on the other hand, lost a lot of privilege. The new space was opened up for all departments. Other projects were put on hold, and they were told that any further ambition that went over the now set in stone budget would have to be paid for by raising money from new sponsors. I'm telling you this story today because my boss told me just this morning that he had raised enough money to renovate three of the four libraries, rebuilding, of all things, the economics library completely. And the last story is a quitting story. In high school, I worked for a small local restaurant. Most of the staff were my classmates, including the entire kitchen staff, but for our manager who had graduated. He and I were good friends, so when he suspected that myself and all the other hourly employees had hours missing from our paychecks, he told me about it. We were young and dumb, and none of us were saving our time slips or keeping track of hours worked. The owner was an angry man who would make Gordon Ramsay seem like a patient, well-tempered man. I quietly and immediately told my co-workers to save all time slips, and it only took two weeks for the eight of us to see the theft from our checks. I wasn't content with simply quitting, so I had everyone wait until about 7 p.m. on a Friday to walk out. We left two people, the owner and my poor friend, who'd informed me of the theft, to run a five-man line. I felt bad for my friend, but he understood. He quit in a more professional manner shortly after. The owner sold the restaurant not long after that. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you liked it, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.